All right, I'm up and running. It's about time, man. I got to tell you something. I tried using a new software to put screen and screen and encoder, and it just doesn't want to work. It screws with the VPN, and it goes in, it goes out, it goes in, and goes out. It's really just a pain in the neck. So, but I'm up. I'm running. I'm sorry, I'm a half hour late, <laughs> but I am here. So, uh, that being said, uh, good to see everybody. Uh, today, I want to talk about uh, the current state of English teaching in China. There's a lot of changes that have happened recently, and uh, that's what we need to talk about today. So, uh, I got a lot of articles I'm going to read, and I hope that. Um, we can uh, share some information out there, some information together. Uh, if you are an English teacher here in China, there's um, a lot of rumors spreading um, about visas and work permits and gao kao and things kind of wrapping up and the influence of online teaching in the marketplace, uh, as well as other uh, nationalities coming in and. Uh, and taking jobs as well. So it's going to be an interesting live stream, I hope. And as always, if you have something you want to share, uh, go ahead and um, share it. Okay, so the first thing I want to talk about is this article that I saw about, uh, oh no, now my paperwork's all screwed up. Sorry, guys, one second here. <sighs> oh, shoot. Where is it? Ah, okay. Well, let's talk about languages in general. No, I don't want to talk about that. That's actually a video that I'll be doing soon. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, here. Let's start with weird questions that we get in China, and then we'll get into the English teaching uh, issues that are going on in China right now. Weird questions people may ask you about China. Uh, this comes from uh, GIC Team Guide in China. It's a very interesting little article. It's kind of tongue-in-cheek, but uh, I thought it was fun. For some reason, a lot of people have a completely skewed sense of China. They see it as a monolithic red spot on the map of billions of identical people, unless they're well-educated or well-traveled. There's, there's generally little understanding of Chinese culture, history, language, geography, and gastronomy. Gastronomy, excuse me. <laughs> Read some of the simple questions I've asked about China over the years. Do they have blank in China? Um, so I got all kinds of questions like, do they have uh, underarm deodorant in China? Do they have toilet paper in China? Do they have napkins in China? All of these things. Uh, you know, I got to shut this off. I'm sorry, guys. One second here. This is going to drive me crazy. All right. So if you have any questions about do they have something in China, here's the first one. Uh, you just insert the noun in, this, in the space. So you say, okay, do they have religion in China? Well, of course they do. You know, In fact, the Chinese constitution states that they have freedom of religion. Um, of course, there's some debate whether or not that's true. If you're a, a Chinese Communist Party member, you're not supposed to have any religion, although Buddhism is big here. Obviously, uh, Islam is big in uh, like in places like the Northwest, uh, and of course, you have Christians here, which is at the largest growing uh, religion in China. So there's lots of religion here. It's just not in your face. It's not talked about. Uh, politicians, uh, even here at the college, we're not supposed to talk about it. Um, this is true. Now, I can, I I can't. Uh, for example, in my classes, I teach about Christmas and Easter. So I have to teach about the religious aspects of those those religions. And I introduce this is Jesus and this is what Christians believe. And that's fine. As long as I'm you know teaching the history and you know uh, you know the who, what, when, why, where of the subjects, it's perfectly fine. Uh, I myself am not a religious guy, so I'm not, going around telling them believe in jesus or you're gonna go to hell <laughs> you know? so but it, there's churches here i mean there's a very famous church in guangzhou uh we've got a church here in zhongshan um, what the government doesn't like is like underground churches you have to be like a, a, a registered church basically do they have gyms in china 
Yes, they do. They have lots of gyms. In fact, it's one of the growing mark. It's one of the growing industries here in China. There's gyms opening up everywhere. Fitness is becoming a really big part of Chinese culture. Uh, from I got here four years ago, and it seems like gyms were just starting to get off. Many of my students would say things like, "Oh, I, I don't want to go to the gym. Um, uh, you know, I don't like to sweat. <laughs> things like this." But uh, more and more, you see. People going to the gym. It's huge, huge business. Do they have pizza in China? Yes, but it's terrible. Unless you go to my buddy's uh, uh, pizza parlor here in Zhongjia Bien. Air, yeah, the, the best pizza here is really Pizza Hut. They have lots of, uh, of other little pizza joints here and there, but it's a real hit and miss. That's one of the biggest questions a lot of expats have with each other is who makes the best pizza? <laughs> so here, yes, they have religion. It's just more closely monitored uh, than in Western nations. In fact, there are tens of millions of Christians, Muslims, and Buddhists in China. See? Yes, they have gyms in China. Um, how do you think I am so swole? <laughs> they have an elite Olympic team. How do you think they train the athletes? Uh, they have low-cost gyms here that are, you know, your basic gym and they have really high-end gyms but they're not nearly as expensive as the ones in the west they're a good deal uh, and they're pretty nice okay do you eat a lot of blank okay so obviously we eat a lot of what do we eat usually the above blank is filled with dog cat or monkey um yes it's true that some chinese people eat dog i mean some chinese people will deny it but it's true. I personally have never seen it. I've never seen a dog restaurant, but you see it in it online. And, you know, I know some people who admit, yeah, they've eaten dog and it's just part of the culture. I personally, I love dogs, but it's not, I'm not an activist. It's not that big of a deal for me. Uh, cat. I have no idea. I doubt it. Monkey. Mm, I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> sure. By Western standards, Chinese people eat some strange stuff. Over the past, yeah, like KFC. Over the past few years in China, I've tried everything from silkworms to pig brain. Well, I haven't had those two. However, not every Chinese menu reads like a tour around your local zoo. Most Chinese people eat fairly normal things. And you need to make an effort to find strange foods. Uh, yes, I live in Guangdong. There's a lot, a lot of strange foods here. Uh, and I just, I don't eat them. I'm not that adventurous when it comes to food, guys. Do people drive in China? Of course they drive. It's a stupid question, you know. <laughs> uh, China has a large car market, the largest in the world. Um, they still have an awful lot of bicycles, and the shared bikes are out there. They have e-bikes, a lot of motorbikes, but the car market here is going crazy. You guys all know that. But public transportation in China is by far the best in the world, I think. Of all the countries I've been to, China has the best um, public transportation. I can go anywhere. Very, very cheap. And uh, with the advent of DD and everything, it just gets even easier. Uh, is China hot or cold? <laughs> China's too big. I mean, it's cold in the north and hot in the south. I mean, I equate the climate here in Guangdong similar to Florida. You know, it's in the wintertime, yeah, I can get a little chilly, but that's like maybe two, three months of the year. The rest of the time, it's hot and humid. So I, it's just like Southern Florida, in my opinion. Isn't China a dangerous place? No, it's not. Um, China is an amazingly safe country. There's, I, I mean, I walk down the street here in the middle of the night in some so-called dodgy neighborhoods and I feel just fine. I wouldn't do that in many neighborhoods back in America. <laughs> All right. So, China, yeah, here it is. China is incredibly safe, especially for foreigners. Of course, as with anywhere, it depends on which city you live in. But really, after three years in China, I can't think of an instance of feeling afraid of being mugged or attacked. I couldn't say that when I lived in America. How many children brought guns to school last week in America? How many got people got shot in Chicago? And you ask me, China's dangerous? No, China is a very safe, pretty safe place. That's one of the perks of living here. That's very true. Is my chat working? Everyone say hi if you are out there. Say hello. Make sure my chat's working. Okay. Aren't you tired of eating rice every day? I don't eat rice every day. Um, 
it's funny because many Chinese people believe that Westerners eat hamburgers every day. <laughs> and it's, I, I do love a hamburger. I don't eat it every day. Um, <laughs> but that's like saying all German people eat hot dogs every day. It's not, not crazy. How often do you go to the Great Wall? And it says, <laughs> how often do you go to Statue of Liberty? I, I don't live, I've never been to the Great Wall. I've never been to Beijing. So um, what are you running away from in China? Uh, here's the thing, just because you work in China or live in China doesn't mean you're running away from anything. Um, that's a stereotype I'm constantly fighting. Uh, but let's get into today's chat. I have these uh, articles that I want to read to you that were very interesting, I think. Um, ah, here we are. Uh, why are students, uh, oh, here, why do Chinese students in the U.S. go home? And it says, blame their English. This is from Stephen Ling uh, from English Teacher uh, website, I guess. It's an interesting article, and it has some good, interesting comments on it, too, and I actually agree with it. I've talked with a lot of my Chinese friends, and they say, yeah, this is a big issue. So... Why are students returning to China in droves? I am Chinese American. I have met and known Chinese students coming to America for years. Me too. I mean, I'm from the Los Angeles area. There's a ton of, of Chinese students in Southern California. I was a visiting professor in elite school in China for seven years. I have seen, known, and talked to many students about their experiences overseas. Based on my personal observations, there are several reasons why many Chinese students are choosing to return home. It's true. Um, in the years or decades past, most students who left China to study in America came from families of modest means, but they had the brains and they wanted a good life. That is why in the early days, only a small percentage returned home to China. The students who now study in the U.S. come from rich families and they want to return home because their parents are wealthy and have and many own businesses, that's true. Uh, hey, Astro, I'm gonna get to your Huawei comment, or Huawei here in a second. The tragedy now also is that many Chinese students prefer to spend most of their time with their own kind. Four years or less is too little time for them to get to know the American way of life. They spend most of their time with other Chinese students and not many really improve their fluency in English. That is abundantly true, actually. Even in Southern California, we have you know, you have Chinatown in, in Los Angeles, but it's very small. But then you have like the San Gabriel Valley and you have parts of Orange County where many of the Chinese students kind of just stick with uh, stick within themselves. I come from a, a town called Irvine and we have the University of California, Irvine, UCI. And they have affectionately nicknamed it the University of Chinese Immigrants because more than half of the students there, and there's tens of thousands of them there, are are uh, from Asia, not just China, they're from Korea, Vietnam, and Japan, but many of them are from China. And if you walk around the neighborhood there, all the restaurants are Chinese. You walk in any res any restaurant, they're all speaking Chinese, and it's just the Chinese hanging out with their local folks. They're very little integration with the community. And you see that in San Gabriel Valley and uh, different parts of LA. And uh, there was a story on the news that said, who are all these rich Chinese kids driving BMWs and, and these you know $100,000 cars and Jaguars and everything? And they're all students. They're all students from wealthy families. And uh, a lot of them do not speak English. And uh, so they just don't feel comfortable living in a country where they don't speak the language, so they come home. And that makes sense to me, I guess. Uh, I have a... a a colleague who just, uh, it was a Chinese girl, just went to Australia to get her master's in English. And she's in the Gold Coast area, Brisbane, I think it was. And she's at the university. And she tells me it's very hard for her to meet non-Chinese friends. So she just hangs out with her Chinese friends, rarely speaks English outside of school. And she has all the plans in the world to come back to China because she feels more comfortable in China. So. That's what's going on there. The tragedy now also is that many Chinese students prefer to spend most, oh, no, we already talked about, 
Uh, after four years, America is still a stranger to them, and many can't find jobs here because their English is still very poor. That is because during the four years here, they don't care to get to know America better. They isolate themselves from its culture and society and really try to learn to improve their English speaking ability. So they have no choice but to return to China. I don't think it's really a no choice thing. They they can choose to do whatever they want. I Just as many of the students that he's talking about in this article, I know many who have studied in America in non-Chinese communities. You know, I've, I've got a really good friend of mine who lived in Wyoming on a on a dude ranch, basically. And she's chose to come back to China because her family's here. Next. So uh, I have read an article after article on this, and many avoid talking about this critical aspect of life in America. If the Chinese do not socialize with the rest of America, they prefer to isolate themselves in their Chinese homes and Chinese community. It is not surprising to see them labeled as unsocial or unfriendly. That's going a little far. But the real reason many Chinese are not comfortable uh, intermingling with Americans is that they do not communicate fluently in English. That is the problem and tragedy of many of the Chinese students studying in America, lacking the ability to speak fluent American English and failing to fit in. They choose to go home to their parents who have the money to support their habits and lifestyles. I think as an English teacher, I think one of the biggest things is confidence. I mean, there's different levels of English fluency among my students. Some are really great, some are really poor, and some are right in the middle. Even if you're right in the middle or even a little poor, I understand you. I understand communicating. You, it, it's, it's not that difficult. So you'll use the wrong verb tense occasionally. It's not gonna, it's not gonna affect, you know, a friendship. I mean, <laughs> I, it, it, or, or, but there's a lack of confidence because they don't speak perfect English. They're afraid to use English. And in addition to teaching, you know, grammar, vocabulary, and idiomatic language, one of my jobs is also to ensure uh, confidence in these students. You know, and then if they make a mistake, so what? Who cares? Uh, but I think it's a lack of confidence in their language ability that is a big problem here and that's that's why they don't come out of their shells and they don't they stay in their little communities okay it's an interesting article let's uh let's answer some of your first questions here so we got astro what's your comment about huawei being banned in the u.s i don't know enough about it you know everyone's talking about huawei being banned um i think that uh i i don't have a huawei phone i I know that Huawei has some technology, the 5G technology that America doesn't have. And I think that's scary for most Americans, the fact that they have something that we don't. And many countries are looking to you. And I know that that uh, I think it was AT&T just rebranded. I saw it on the news. They rebranded their, uh, their 4G LTE as 5G when it really isn't. I don't really want to – I don't have any comment about it because I don't know enough about it. Um, hell, that shit is way above my pay grade. I can tell you, on the ground here in China, people are talking about it, but it's not that big a deal. Most people think that Huawei is going to just do fine. They're a juggernaut of a company, and America is not the only place that that uh, that they can sell it to. And they, you know, I think it's what they call it, the I five nations: you know, Australia, New Zealand, Britain, Canada. There's many, many other places that Huawei can do business. <laughs> and if they just keep doing what they're doing, they're, they're going to be just fine, I think. Uh, I do believe that it, in one way, it doesn't really matter what the hardware or the software is, the technology behind it. Because if nations want to spy on other nations, they'll be able to do it no matter what software or hardware they're using. So I, I, I'm, I'm not buying the whole national security thing, but I, it's kind of a ruse, I think, but there's many other reasons for it, I'm sure. Uh, healing I need, healing I need, where are, who are you? I don't know, where are you now? I'm in Zhongshan, China. Uh, I'm currently finishing up the term. I'm testing my students. I am uh, getting ready to take off for the summer. I'll be gone. I'll be arriving in America on July 4th, 
Independence Day and traveling a lot. I plan on visiting. I'll be traveling for about two months, actually two and a half months, about 10 weeks. And I'll be visiting six countries, seven if you include China. So there you go. Hi, Ro. Happy Friday from Adelaide, Australia. Very cool. Good to see you. Uh, happy Friday to you, too. This week, I had to go to the dentist. I had a broken molar. So I don't remember what I had. went for my teeth cleaning, and, like, the next day, my molar broke. It, like, cracked. It was very – it sucked a lot. And so it was very, very painful. So I had the CT scan and all of that. And to be honest with you, when they did the x-rays and they did the CT scan, it only cost like $20. And they said, yeah, your tooth is cracked. Ah, it's a bitch getting older, I think. <laughs> so um, so I, I had to wait a few days for the, for the dentist to have a moment. And they extracted my molar. This happened just yesterday. So if I'm talking funny, it's because I'm still in a lot of pain and I have some stitches in my jaw right now. Very, very uncool. I was on the ch in the chair for over two hours with them with a hammer, you know, trying to bust out my molar that needed to be removed. So I had to go get a an implant in a couple of months. Not happy about that good news is is that in china dental work is pretty it's first of all it's great the dentist offices that i've been to are fantastic and it's about a tenth the price of what it is back home so you know i'm thinking of as i turn 40 this summer i'm thinking of like getting some other work on my teeth done uh hello sir hey billy good to hear from you man happy friday to you too dude after this summer, you will leave our school. No, um, I'm just going on vacation, dude. I am going, I mean, I get about uh, 10, 11, almost 12 weeks off this summer. So this will still be my home. I'm just traveling, going to different um, countries. And I'll be back in the fall, and I'm doing another term here at the college. So that should, I'm looking forward to it. You know, I'm. The college here is a, the neighborhood is kind of boring. Most of my friends and everything live downtown. So it's a 30, 40 minute drive downtown. But when there's no students here, uh, it is very, very quiet and peaceful. Although they do play music twice a week or twice a day, you know, at lunchtime and about nine o'clock, the music starts blasting again. And uh, that's all right, it's only for an hour. <laughs> All right, let's talk about uh, another article that I have here. I'm playing George Michael, Careless Whisper, because it's Friday night, and I can't drink alcohol tonight. I'm drinking tea because of my tooth. They gave me – look at all this meds. It's a tooth extraction, and it was very painful. So I got painkillers. You know, I got instructions on what to do and how to do it. I've got three other pills here that I have to take four times a day. You know, antibiotics and stuff. It's just a nightmare. I hate – I'm not sick, but I hate being physically – there's something physically wrong with me. Torch neighbors are born. <laughs> Aaron, uh, dang, dude, I can never properly watch live stream since I got to China. Why not? I, I Through the VPN, it sucks. I know sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. I'm sorry, Aaron. Uh, Aaron, where are you, dude? What part of China are you in? Okay, a couple other things that going on here in China with the English teaching. Uh, I tried to go to a job fair in Shenzhen. I was just going there to do some networking and film it. Uh, and... It took me about three hours to get to Shenzhen. It was ridiculously, it was just a nightmare. And when I got there, it was almost over. There were only 10 schools there. So I didn't do any interviewing. I didn't talk to anybody. Uh, oh, dang. Sorry, my jaw's starting to hurt again. It sucks. I got like stitches in here and it just feels weird. Okay. Uh, oh, you're in Hangzhou. Uh, I want to go visit Hangzhou. Yeah. Go see the the automated hotel there. But anyways, I was in Shenzhen and I couldn't 
get to it. But I did talk to some people who did go, and they said it was really kind of disappointing. Um, but people are continuing to get higher salaries, and they are um, the demand is still there. However, now you have this online teaching platforms. Um, a lot of English teachers who have been here a long time, they they don't work for a training center or a college. What they do is they set up shop in you know their their house or in an office somewhere. And uh, these guys are getting you know picked on by the government, not for teaching when they shouldn't be, but for running an unregistered school. To open a school here, there's tons and tons of paperwork and regulations that you have to follow. It's not an easy gig to open up your own school. So I have a good friend of mine who has a really good friend, but a friend of mine who has been here for 20 years, he's married with kids and everything, and he has been caught and he's getting kicked out because of this. It's very, very unfortunate that things like that happen. So all the rumors you hear about visa crackdowns and, and stuff are very true and it's, it's happening. Only those who use VPNs could cross the block. Well, obviously, dude, you have one. <laughs> so online foreign English teaching is growing in China. But and this comes from JobTube Daily. Uh, and it's uh, the source was on China Daily. I think this is an interesting article about uh, online online China or online English training, which is growing hugely. Everyone knows was it, I think it's VIP Kid, which is an American company, but it's got amazing numbers. The numbers are just huge how they're doing it. Online English language courses for children saw an explosive growth in 2018, according to a report released by data monitoring firm Trust Data on Tuesday. The report on China's online English education market for children shows that the market has had more than 15 million users last year, up 168% year on year. It's expected that the market size will surpass 50 billion yuan or $7.3 billion in 2019. That is insane. The market pattern is one-on-one -on -one teaching has been gradually formed and the top brands have secured a lion's share of the market as per the report. Market size doubles in one year. The market size of online education for children was $21.3 billion in 2018 an increase of 104% year on year, which one-on-one -on -one teaching taking up more than half of the market size. The online users doubled from 5.7 million in 2017 to over 15 million in 2018. Insiders say that as Chinese parents increase their spending on education, online education gets more recognition from China's internationalization processes. Online courses, online course users will keep going, the Beijing News reports. And the report echoes their opinion. Data from the report shows that the penetration rate of online education rose 0.8% in 2015 to 9.1% in 2018, up 11 folds within four years. It's projected that the penetration rate will reach 12% in 2019. So it's even growing even faster. It's ridiculous. And uh, everyone's doing this. I mean, I know people who are supplementing their income sitting on a beach in Vietnam doing this. I know people who are living in a van somewhere in, you know, Utah, and they have a satellite link and they teach out of the back of their van. It's, it's from everywhere. It's pretty cool. Data from the report shows that the market share of VIP kid is 68.4%, the largest one, followed by 51 talk, 11%, Dada English at 7.8%, and VIP Junior at 5.7%. So VIP Kid has almost two thirds of the market, actually more than two thirds of the online market. More than more new users choose VIP among all online English education brands. Since September 2018, 70% of all new users were snapped up by VIP Kid. And it's not just the, the students, the teachers are going there too. This is, there is also a significant difference between VIP Kid and the other brands on user activity since early 2018, the monthly active users of VIP Kids has risen while other brands didn't see much growth. 
people in first and second tier cities take up 60 per, 65% of all paid users. Wow. Becoming a major force in online edu online English course market for children. The number of users in third and fourth tier cities is growing. Uh, so online teaching is useless. I don't think it's useless. I mean, it's convenient and uh, I personally don't like it. I like the interaction with one-on-one. -on -one. That's why I don't do it. But I do know a lot of people who do. I mean, you can. It's you don't have to go to a training center. It's more cost efficient. You can sit at home and have a one-on-one -on -one class with a teacher just like this. Can Trump's tariff affect the world and truly make America great again? I don't think so. You know, I, I think free trade is better. Uh, I think. Fair trade is better. I think tariffs is not the way to go. That's my personal opinion about it. Um, I was more of a fan of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which China wasn't a part of, but it was designed to contain China and kind of force their hand in some of these trade negotiations. A tariff just, I think, punishes people, um, not just Chinese, but Americans too. Uh, I believe in online training. Okay. Or teaching. Aaron, do you teach online? And if so, what's your experience about it? Let us know. The quality of foreign teachers, a challenge. The quality of foreign teachers is a key factor when parents choose English learning platform. The foreign teachers of China's online English education brands mainly come from North America, Europe, and Southeast Asia. All of VIP kids, 70,000 plus foreign teachers. My God. There's 70,000 teachers on VIP Kid are from North America, while 69% of 551 Talks foreign teachers are from Southeast Asia. Well, that's interesting. Is, there's one, is, v, is 51 Talk, is that the one where you just pick up the phone and you talk to someone? No, no, no. As different brands fight for foreign teachers, the recruitment, high salary, and staff mobility will become a challenge, industry analysts say. Uh, currently, I don't think that there's any oversight or um, regulations regarding online teachers in China. So, but I know if you want to make money in online teaching, you have to build your student base. And that comes from recommendations and experience. And the longer you do it, the more experience you have, the more credentials you have, the more money you can get and the more students you, you can get. Okay, what do we got? The Philippines have a lot of good English. They do, that's true. Um, and they're, they're and of course, in the Philippines, they're not paid very much. So if you come from the Philippines to China to teach, which many are doing now, you can make a good living, send a lot of money back. They're friendly and they are good teachers. So I... I, I from a market standpoint, having Filipino teachers here would be bad for me because the more teachers there are, you know, the less money I make. But I do think that the Philippines is a great resource for the market to tap. I mean, it's right. It's very close. The demand, they want to come here and the, the, we need teachers here. So I say bring them on over. It's fine. In many, in China, millions of teachers are, or excuse me, in China, millions are learning English just for leisure. This is from Nina Porzuki, of English teacher. This is an interesting article, I think, that uh, I say Wang Ling, who goes by her English name, Lin, started taking English classes a few months ago. Lin is 31 and very fashionable. She puts on her designer sunglasses as my interpreter and I pile into her enormous white SUV and head to her English training center. Lynn is determined to master English. And if she combines that determination with even a fraction of the, pra of the patience it takes to survive the Beijing traffic we encounter, when I'd say she's in pretty good shape. Yeah, I'm not shy, she says. My level is very low, but I'm not shy to say it. That's the thing, you know, it's don't be shy. If you're an English learner, don't be shy. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. Use the tools that you have and, you know, let me fix it. That's what I'm there for. You know, don't be afraid to make mistakes. 
Lynn takes classes at Education First, EF. That's one of the largest, I think it's the largest in the world, actually. Um, and they're not cheap. The course she's enrolled in costs nearly $6,000. My God. Yeah, that's, that's on the high end of what people pay, but you can get them cheaper than that. But if you want to go to the large training centers, that's what people pay pay for English. I mean, they pay a ton of money for English classes. It's a, it's a huge moneymaker. EF has English training centers around the world. The company opened its first center in China in 1993, catering to seven and eight-year-olds. Today, there are more than 200 centers around the country, and EF's clients are increasingly young professionals. And stay-at-home mom, says EF China's executive vice president, Angela Xu. Stay-at-home mom, she says, represents a new type of English language learner in China, the leisure learner. Yeah, I get a lot of. I, I have a lot of housewife uh, students, and they're learning because, for many reasons, one, they want to teach their own children English. They want to travel. Uh, they think it's a way of bettering themselves. They're interested in Western culture. There's tons of reasons. How can you identify uh, healing? I need sorry. How can you identify the good online teaching organizations and the bad? Many of them are greedy and always charge a high fee. Yeah, I don't know how to identify one good one from basically reputation. You know, ask around. If, you have, if your friends have a good experience at one, I'm sure you'll have a good experience there too. Uh, as far as charging high fees, you know, it's like price shopping. You know. Buy an iPhone at this store, buy it over there. Which one's better price? Yeah. It's expensive, I know. Ah, oh, sorry, I have to drink my tea. They want to travel the world, see the world, be able to communicate by themselves, says Shu. That's true. I have a, a student who gave me a great compliment a couple of weeks ago. Uh, she travels for business and she always had to take an interpreter with her, whether it be to Indonesia, to Japan, to Korea. She would always have to find an interpreter that would, um, that would speak that language and interpret. But ever since taking my classes over the last couple of years and learning English, she doesn't have to take any interpreter because she can communicate with everyone in the international language of English. And she was so excited to tell me she went to Jakarta and, checked into a hotel and did all her business meetings without any uh, any help from an interpreter. She, she did all in English. And I was it made me feel so great as a teacher to hear that. Uh, the Metin will be better. Metin's good. Yeah, it's expensive. You know, it's just it's just like EF or Wall Street English or Web International or New Oriental or any of these other training centers. Metin is another brand of those there's very very similar they're, they're almost cookie cutter um but metin is a good company they're very forward and progressive they pay their employees okay you know they have good recognition and the students all seem to be happy their curriculum there is brand new they've revamped it and it's it's pretty good lynn is typical in this new wave she moved to beijing five years from her hometown in hunan province Lynn and her husband started an advertising business together. They did pretty well, bought a big apartment in the kind of complex that's popping up everywhere in China, a cluster of high-rise apartments with some parks and ponds wedged in between. A good place for toddlers, she says. And Lynn has a toddler of her own. She works now as a full-time mom. Yeah, um, I'm going to do another video very soon about architecture in China, specifically in Zhongshan, and the difference between the old kind of uh, apartment blocks that are very mixed used and the new super blocks that they've got everywhere. Uh, it's going to be really interesting because in America, there's a lot of talk about suburbia and how it's kind of closed off communities and, and you have to get in your car to drive to the market. You have to get your car to go anywhere. Even if your house is literally right next to a highway because of cul-de-sacs and the way these neighborhoods are set, you have to get in your car and drive over 10 speed bumps out of the community around the corner just to get on the highway. And that's happening here, too, only instead of using your cars, you have to exit the garden, the community that you're in, just and walk back down the street just to get to the local supermarket. It's a very interesting um, uh, housing dynamic that's going on in China, the new wave of architecture here. 
Uh, her toddler, who goes by the nickname Shishi, is darling. She's two with pigtails and big cheeks. Shishi is the main reason Lynn decided to study English. Lynn did learn some English in middle school, but she never really paid attention. <laughs> she never really cared about learning any foreign language, she says, until her daughter was born. I have so many students at my college who have been learning English for many years, and they can't say anything. They, I, again, it comes to their confidence. They don't have the confidence. They'll, they'll look at me, and they'll try to say something, and then they'll turn to their friends, I don't know how to say this. I'm like, well, <laughs> yes, you do. Just you know, say one word, point, use other forms of communication. I will get it. I will help you. Okay. In the future in my daily life, I can't separate my life with the language English. I need to teach my kid English and we will travel to other countries. She says, adding, I always buy things online in English, so I need it. Oh, okay. So that's good. No tava. The last part is especially important. Lynn buys everything for Shishi online, baby clothes, baby shampoo, baby food. She buys it all from abroad. She needs to read the English labels and instructions. Interesting. Hmm. Tariffs, tariffs. <laughs> In China, she says a lot of things we think it's not safe, like milk. That's a big thing. The the baby formula scandal that happened a couple years ago, the lingering effect of that is ridiculous and it's still going on. It's incredible. My daughter's milk is all from abroad. Yeah. In, 20, in 2008, some baby formula produced in China was found laced with a plastic melam melamine. I think that's how I don't know. That was seven years ago, but still Lynn will only buy formula formula. Foreign baby formula. Again, the lingering effect of that has been enormous. No one buys milk in China. You, they go to Hong Kong or they get it shipped here. It's pretty insane. Uh, they just speak English bad, even my roommates. They're not bad. They're really good. If you can say a sentence to me, you have good English. I know who you are. You're one of my students. And you have very good English, and so do your roommates. You, they just need confidence. You know, you have more ability than you realize. Your passive vocabulary is fantastic. I mean, you understand a lot of the things that I say. Your active vocabulary of what you're saying is what we need to improve. We need to uh, give you more practice and working so we build your confidence. You'd be surprised. If you were to sit down and write down all the vocabulary that you know, I think you'd be very impressed with the level of English that most people in China have. They're just afraid to use it or because they can't recall it immediately, they believe that their English is poor and it's not. It can always be better. Everyone's English can be, my English can be better. I learn new English words every day. I learned a new one just yesterday at lunch with my friends. So where you fit on that scale, it doesn't matter. It's communication. That's the most important thing and confidence in what you know what you have so don't be afraid back in the car lynn calls up her ef english center to see if she can squeeze in a last minute class lately lynn has been studying for her upcoming trip abroad she and her husband plan to go to austria later this year it will be her first time outside of china and she tells me her teacher has been instructing her on some of the very practical english phrases she will need to hit the shops is this a small, medium, large, extra large? Do you like shopping, I asked her. Yeah, it's my favorite thing. I did another video about this last year about how the Chinese are traveling everywhere. And, you know, yes, they're learning English, but I think the world needs to put more focus on learning Chinese to welcome the Chinese tourists into their nations, including America. It's good for everyone, you know. Uh, no, I think they didn't feel interested in English. Oh, they might not. That's true. If you don't have an interest in English, then the then why learn it? You know, I I don't have a an interest in coding computers, so I'm not going to learn it. And um, part of my job is to get them interested in English. I wish I had more effect. I can focus on that more. Um, Learning English, will, when you're young and then you're in college, you cannot 
foresee the future very well as far as where you're going to be and what kind of job you're going to have and the opportunities that you're going to have. And, you know, I know when I was 19, 20 years old, I thought I knew everything and I didn't know shit. <laughs> um, if they do, they will listen to pop music and try to speak English daily. They have, they just look English as a test subject. Yeah. Well, it's not just pop music. It's movies. It's TV show. It's being part of a, a global conversation that's happening in English. Uh, that uh, and in China, you are closed off from that, mostly because of the big firewall, but also because of the culture here. It's still really closed off to the outside world, um, and a lot of that is by choice. You know, most Chinese people I meet, you're you're not one of them, man. You get a VPN and you're you're into it, which is great. But the vast majority of people in China are quite happy just using the internet that they have and the apps that they have, and they live a very happy life. And uh, they're just, that's why they're not interested in world cultures. America is the same way, by the way. America is very, we, they, they don't think very globally. You know, they, it's all about them, 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 right? But they're lucky because they're part of the English speaking world conversation. Uh, that, that does make a difference. The rest of the world doesn't speak China unless you're from Malaysia or Singapore or something. Uh, or the rest of the world doesn't speak Chinese. So it's very difficult for the outside world to look into China and try to understand and, uh, the country and the, the popular culture here. Did you happy staying in China? Yeah, I'm very happy in China. I love this place. Uh, I've been here for three and a half years. I have no plans on leaving. It's beautiful. The people are friendly. The food is fascinating. I walk out my door every day and it's an adventure. And the longer I'm here, the more comfortable I am and the more uh, things kind of come onto my radar. And I just, I realize just how big everything really is and how much I still don't know about this country. So I'm not bored, that's for sure. It's an amazing place. Um, yes, I'll have to leave eventually someday, but not anytime soon. In the meantime, I'm using this as a way to see the world, I guess. Mm -hmm. So that was that interesting conversation topics. I'm digging it. Okay, let's see. Okay. Uh, your questions people ask you. Here, here's something for foreign English teachers. This is something that many of my colleagues have been talking about lately. Attention, thousands of foreign employees got arrested and deported. This is from International Pub. A couple about two weeks ago, I believe. The Public Security Bureau of China is now on a mission to find, arrest, and deport 5,000 illegal foreign workers from China, mostly because, mo mostly because most of them are unqualified English teachers from abroad that local Chinese claim are stealing teaching jobs from more qualified bilingual Chinese graduates who actually majored in English abroad in the UK, Canada, America, and Australia. Who makes better teachers for Chinese children is a separate debate. But what is beyond dispute is the following reality. Well, first, let me address that. It's not that we're stealing jobs. The, there's two parts to English training in any country. You have local teachers who are bilingual and help with the very basic primary parts of language training. They, they provide a very valuable resource. And then you have the the foreign teachers who are native speakers and come in and provide the next level that, and they're not just teaching the students the next level, they're teaching the local teachers the next level. Cause I don't care. You can study English your entire life. Like I have, and still not know everything. I, I probably don't know 70, 80% of what English has to offer. And I'm a professional English teacher. That's how big English is. So it's a team effort. The local Chinese, or the, the local teachers and the foreign teachers together make up a team of educators. You can't have one without the other, in my opinion. Uh, oh, what should a university teacher get per month, like 7K? It varies. Um, I think the average is about 7K nationally, but it depends on what college you're at, how many classes you're teaching. 
uh, are you teaching English majors? Are you just teaching general English? And uh, then you have to think about, you know, um, excuse me. <laughs> you have to think about where you're going to be living. Is it free? I mean, a total, it's not just your salary. It's a total compensation package that you have to look at if you're looking at teaching here, whether it be at a college, a training center, a kindergarten, doesn't matter if you're teaching at an international school. And ultimately, it's your choice. Whatever you believe you're worth based on the market, that's what you should go get. And I don't think you should look at it from a salary only. And because it also depends on what city you're living. If you're making 7,000 in Guangzhou, you ain't doing shit. But if you're making 7,000 in a fourth, in a village or a third tier city, you know, you can live a happy life. Again, look at the total compensation package on it. Uh, I know people who make a lot less than that, and I know people who make a lot more than that. Time to get that reward money for turning in illegal teachers. Yeah, Billy, uh, that's part of this. I heard, I saw a video, uh, an article that's, I don't know if it was true or not. Some people told me it was fake news, but some teachers can get, or some people can get a hundred, a couple hundred RMB. I've even seen a video where it said some people were making like 10,000 RMB for turning in an illegal teacher. I don't know if that's real. It sounded like outrageous. You know, we'll see. <laughs> uh, English is just a medium of global communication. If there are more other countries using Chinese, Chinese will become the medium just like English. Yes, I agree with you. And because English, or China is growing, and there's more Chinese speakers in the world than any other language. I think it'll, I, whether or not it'll be a global language, Chinese, remains to be seen only because it's mainly just spoken here. The English is spoken in every country in the world and it's become really the true global language. But um, in time, you'll, I have another video I'm doing about language and some languages are dying and some are you know, growing and Chinese is growing, but English is growing twice as fast as Chinese and some languages are completely dying. And I, I'm going to do another video separate to that. It would be really cool to see some kind of combination of the two, you know, the, you know, they talk about Chinglish in China in Southern California, they have something called Spanglish, which is like half English and half Spanish. I'm guilty of it. I've used it many, many times. Um, one thing I've learned lately, I've been learning a little Japanese, and many Japanese words are based on English, like the Japanese word for computer is computer. So I think as the world gets smaller, I think language will start to combine. It might take a couple hundred years, but you know, we'll see what happens. It's not a competition. You know, these are just tools that we use to communicate. Hello, everyone. Okay, I might have a job teaching sports English at a sport university. I'm wondering if I should expect more because it's specialized. Maybe not sports, <laughs> you know, the, I, I don't know. I Probably not. If it's specialized, probably not. Unless you're teaching high level math or economics um, or physics or something like that, where the demand is huge. The demand for sports English is not very big. Uh, and there's lots of I mean, there there are jobs, but there's lots of people who are willing to do that job. I don't expect it to to pay very much. Uh, well, good luck, where, uh, Diego. Um, where is the uh, where is the sports university that you're talking about? I'm curious. You know, even the dialect of Guangdong is dying. Well, healing. I need. That's a very good point. That's part of the thing. You know, Cantonese, Guangdonghua. Is it dying? Maybe it's going to take a long time to get there, but there's fewer and fewer people speaking it in Guangdong in the Pearl River Delta here. Many of the people are coming from other parts of China. And of course, Putonghua is the, the real dominant language here. But of course, in Hong Kong, it's Cantonese. And many of my friends and colleagues speak Cantonese with their family and their friends. But they'll go they'll go from Cantonese to to Mandarin like every other sentence they're switching off. And they're not teaching Guangdonghua anymore in the schools here. And it's basically a family thing. So it's going to take a couple generations, but especially on the mainland part of China, it's disappearing. Uh, the Even the traditional Chinese characters have been disappearing from Guangdong. In Hong Kong, though, 
that's going to be where that that's the battleground of Cantonese versus Mandarin and how it's all going to play out. So you got to watch Hong Kong really, <laughs> even and uh, Macau as well. Uh, Shenyang. Uh, Shenyang, I think, is in the far north. I teach a Chinese girl tennis here in the States, and her dad knows somebody. Yeah, it's good. Always good to have a little guanxi, right? More and more Chinese are speak Mandarin. Cantonese is no longer te teaching. Yeah, that's – yeah. Again, and it's not just the Cantonese. It's the little dialects in the different towns. You know, you have Chalanghua, Shichihua, <laughs> you know, you have – um, Chao Guan Hua, Huizhou Hua. There's all these little different dialects. It's all going away. Uh, it's going to be a blanket Mandarin in mainland China. What the again? The battleground is going to be in Hong Kong. It's going to be interesting to see how that all comes together in the next few generations. I won't be alive to see it. I'm sure. All right, let's move on here. Um, the Public Security Bureau claims over 700 foreigners using fake diplomas and illegal visas were caught in their sting operations in 2018. Interesting. The fake diplomas, uh, you're starting to see less and less of that now that the government requires authentication in your home country for that. Uh, it used to be you could just get a fake diploma, print it out, and get it in Hong Kong or something, and they stamp it when you get here and you got your work visa. It's much, much harder to obtain a Z visa now. Uh, illegal visas are still an issue, though. They're, they recently came out just today. They've revamped the whole look of the of the visas and the residence permits to include a photo, and your photo is like supposed to match the photo of your passport or something. Uh, ah, Karam Karamazov, I think. That, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, Hassan. Hey, yeah, yeah. The non-native from our. I remember we talked before in the last live. I just want to tell you that I'm in China right now, Khufu City, and life here is great. Wonderful, man. Well, I'm glad you made it, dude. How do you like China so far? How long have you been here now? And what are you up to? What are you doing? You had a lot of very interesting questions that, unfortunately, I didn't have a good answer for. So uh, hopefully you found the right gig and you found all your answers. I'd love to hear stuff like that, dude. In 2012, seven years ago, less than 1,000 foreign teachers were expelled from China. Only one third of them current number. Back then, teachers caught working without a Z visa were simply warned or fined. Today, they are booted out after spending 15 days in jail, paying a $2,000 fine, and sent home as a convicted felon with a three to five year reentry ban. That's true. I have another video where I talk about working illegally in China and the penalties, punishments that are associated with that. They have teeth and they're they will get you. <laughs> it's happening. Most will never be able to get another travel visa and the rest for the rest of their lives because they are now tagged as an illegal migrant worker and convicted felon in the many databases of global law enforcement. You know, that's interesting. I also know people who have been kicked out for various reasons and been able to get a tourist visa like six months later. Uh, I know one guy who, who uh, got arrested for you know what uh, various reasons i know i won't go into it but he was arrested spent like a month in jail and got kicked out and six months later he got a 10-year work uh, tourist visa and uh he comes and goes as he pleases <laughs> so it's 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 interesting it's a hit or miss i think yeah. uh, foreigners deported from china in 2016 over 63 percent were because they did not have a z visa uh, and 20% were because of crimes, mostly drugs. Uh, if, if you're the, the, the biggest crime here foreigners do is working on a non-Z visa. They're illegal workers. That's the number one. Number two is crime. And the biggest crime that foreigners, it's not just foreigners, it's everyone here, is drugs, uh, mostly marijuana. Uh, but there's other drugs here. In fact, they did a study and they actually used the city of Zhongshan in the study and how they did it. They, they tested the sewage water for, you know, drugs and Zhongshan was one of the highest in the, in the country, which surprised the hell out of me. I couldn't believe it because Zhongshan's a beautiful family friendly city. You don't have needles and druggies running around. It's not a thing, but the two biggest ones are marijuana. That's still a thing here. I mean, 
hell, here on the college, you got kids running around with marijuana leaves on their T-shirts. I see otherwise, like, nerdy girls with marijuana leaves on their socks and on their little purses. I don't know if they realize what that really is, but it's there. So if you're caught with that, yeah, you're, you're out. But also party drugs, you know, the ecstasy and things like that, you know, the... Um, that's still a big, big thing here, I think. Uh, in 2016, the Public Security Bureau of China confirmed that 2,987 foreigners were arrested and deported from China. The bulk of the arrests, 62%, were related to foreigners caught working without a genuine work Z visa. Even 487 foreigners with Z visas were deported when they were discovered that the Z visa did not match up between the actual employer, the invitation letter, and the visa. That's another thing that they're going after is these agencies that are not, they, they all have to match the invitation letter, the Z visa, and the employer. And if one of those doesn't match, you're hit. It's unfortunate. Uh, yet others were deported for violent acts or bad behavior, including four rape incidences and 128 assaults, most, mostly while intoxicated. Beer is a drug. <laughs> Alcohol is a drug. Yeah, that's why I don't go to bars late at night. You know, you get, people get drunk, they start fighting. It's kind of stupid. Uh, others were deported after medical checks revealed that they were infected with contagious diseases such as hepatitis, HIV, tuberculosis, etc. Yeah, and still others were deported for crimes committed in China, ranging from shoplifting to fraud to auto theft. Wow. Twelve others were deported for miscellaneous other reasons, including suspicious, suspecting spies, public begging, and attempting religious recruitment in public. Yeah, don't do it. <laughs> uh, the number one thing is still the Z visa, but all those other ones are very interesting, I think. <laughs> uh, is you call weed? Yeah, it's weed. It's dama, marijuana. Is that the things you call weed? Yeah, dama. Uh, it's illegal here, man. And everyone has, I've seen children, 10 year olds with it on their shirt, little hats and stuff. You're basically telling the world, yes, I like drugs. Why do you wear that stuff? I come from California where that is legal. Everyone uses it and it's very, very common. In fact, many places in America are like that. Um, it's part of the culture in Canada. It's completely legal. Parts of Europe, it's completely legal. But here it's very illegal. You don't touch it. You don't go near it. You don't do anything with it. If someone near you has got it, you run the other way because it's you can get in a lot of trouble. Yet many, many kids have it on their bodies, you know, advertising. Yeah, I love it. I love it. I don't understand. I don't understand that. Uh, oh, there we go. It's been seven days since I came here, and the local people are so super nice. My training school is just open, and the work is great so far, and the Chinese kids are so cute. Yeah, the kids are cute. Man. So it's a new school. Okay. Uh, where is Khufu City? What province are you in? They just think that it is a symbol of hip-hop. <laughs> That's an issue. I've heard that before, too, you know, that you, you got famous, you know, rappers from America like, Snoop Dogg or Dr. Dre and have, you know, <laughs> uh, video, you know, videos and songs about smoking it. It's not a symbol of hip hop. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's actually kind of sad that people think that the marijuana leaf is a symbol of hip hop culture. It's not marijuana. Marijuana is a completely own genre of culture. You know, there's a lot of, things associated with hip hop. Marijuana is a very small piece of that. And that's unfortunate. Yeah. Really the black man rappers smoke all the day. <laughs> that's not true. You know, you got maybe the the famous ones, you there's many, many famous ones that smoke all day. Uh, and they advocate the medical benefits of marijuana smoking. Uh, and uh, but the not everyone smokes it and it's it's yeah, Wiz does, you know, Snoop Dogg. Dr. Dre doesn't. Dr. Dre is clean. He's sober. Um, I know that because I met him. I'm talking about uh, Eminem doesn't do it. Just because two or three of the famous ones do it doesn't mean it's a symbol of the entire hip-hop culture. 
And uh, so I hope we can break that connection. That's unfortunate. Maybe they wear this stuff because they see it in pop culture, just think it's cool. That's true. You know, I, I'm fine with that. It is part of pop culture, marijuana, but it's not part of Chinese culture. You know, considering just how dangerous it is, if you're caught with that stuff, it's really bad in China. They have very strict rules. And it's not just in China. It's all of Southeast Asia, maybe excluding Cambodia. But shit, if you go to the Philippines and you do that, they'll shoot you. <laughs> you know? So you got to be really careful. Yeah. Okay. We also discovered that the PSB has increased their visa enforcement squads by 350 personnel nationwide to a total staff that now exceeds 8,000 people with a 2017 goal of finding and deporting at least 5,000 illegal workers. So there's over 8,000 PSB people who are looking for illegal workers. And it's not just English teachers, mind you. There's lots of illegal workers here from all countries. It's you know, it's it's not as bad as the United States. The United States has lots of illegal workers, but uh, you know, of course, in China, foreigners stand out a lot more. But then it's not just English. There just happens to be a lot of English teachers in China. But there's many workers who are skirting the laws and not doing it, not doing things properly. Uh, in 2016, they conducted more than 700 random school visits and insist they will increase this number to 1,000 to 2,017. Those arrested for Z-Visa or university degree for, uh, forgeries came from these provinces. Number one was Beijing. Uh, Chongqing, very low. Guangdong, 229, about a quarter of that in Beijing. So it looks like Beijing is number one place for this. Uh, number two is Guangdong, of course. Of course, Zhejiang, yeah. Uh, Hunan, 115. That was a lot. Um, and Shanghai, 610. So Beijing, Shanghai are the two top, and Guangdong is maybe a third of that. Uh, interesting. There's a lot more in Guangdong. It's illegal to smoke sex cigarettes. You know, cigarettes will kill you faster than marijuana will, that's for sure. The reason why cigarettes are legal is because there's a lot of money to be made in it. Don't smoke cigarettes, man. You, know, you can smoke weed your whole life and not die from it. You smoke cigarettes for a couple of years and you can die. In 2018, the Public Security Bureau conducted more than 2,000 random visa checks visits in 27 provinces compared to only 127 in 2014 in six provinces. Clearly, they have expanded their hunting grounds. The Public Security Bureau obtained a 6% budget increase to expand their visa enforcement operations in 2017 and are hiring and training another 720, 745 new visa enforcement officers and 210 special investigators to help grow their sting operations. 2016 was the first year that the PSB actually started to jail the black agents and recruiters caught selling fake diplomas and TEFL certificates and or telling new arrivals to China it was okay to work without a Z visa. I can't tell you how much, when I, when I was first coming to China, I'd say about when I was looking for a job and I was interviewing with a bunch of people, more than half of them were these guys telling me, you don't need one, come here, you know, um, we can get you a fake TEFL, we can get you a fake diploma. These these agents are so mm, amazingly bad. Never go with an agent, never go with an agency, and never believe them when they say you don't need one. <laughs> So they're finally jailing those guys. So it's not just the teachers getting involved. It's all the people who are spreading false information about this stuff. Um, Diego, I have heard of people going home to America or whatever, smoking some weed back home and getting arrested in China later. Urine tests in a bar, jail, in the port. Yeah, that's true. Uh, they, in fact, they even tell the Chinese nationals, if you go to these countries, don't smoke weed because you come back still in your system for over 30 days, you can get busted. Uh, I know that the medical, the, our annual medical screening that we do for our visa does not include drug testing. It's mostly looking for HIV and hepatitis and things like this, but they can. It's very simple test for them to dip it in and take a look. And in the big cities, they will close down some of the bars that are popular with foreigners and do uh, urine tests 
at the bar or at the jail and you'll get deported. That happens a lot. So yeah, you can't do it. Kufu City City is Shan, Shandong province. Okay, so you are pretty far north. I hope you're ready for the cold. It'll get cold there this winter. The modern Chinese children love hip hop culture, although they don't understand a thing about hip hop hip hop. Um yeah, <laughs> I can see that. I love hip hop culture. I think I love hip hop music. I mean, I, I don't, I don't blast it every time. I love all kinds of music, but hip hop is really good. You know, it's not just American hip hop. It's you have Chinese hip hop. There's Korean hip hop. There's hell. There's even Canadian hip hop. There's mixed genres. You can get hip hop with rock. You know, that's a uh, it's music culture. You know, it's what I love about it. Okay, uh, 2016 was the first, oh, I got that one. Okay. Ah. The Public Security Bureau increased their public reward from 5,000 RMB to 10,000 RMB to informants who provided information leading to the arrest of illegal foreign workers. This is where I've been told that that's not true. I've been told that this is fake news, that it's not 5,000 to 10,000 RMB. It's more like 500 to 1,000 RMB. Whether I, so I can't confirm this. Um, one person we know of earned over $80,000 in just one year, snitching out expat workers her boss sold fake university degrees to. Sources at the PSB said that roughly 20% of all the informants work at the same school as the teachers they reported. I think, I think that's a little overhyped. Once again, we urge all ESL and TEFL teachers coming to work in China to follow the law and not the, and not the advice of unlicensed recruiters who will not lift a finger to help you if you get yourself arrested in China. Working on an FM or L visa can get you arrested and jailed on the spot in China, no matter what your job recruiter told you. Yeah, don't listen to these guys. You become the expert when it comes to working visas and the laws here. Don't listen to anyone else. You know, do your own research. Uh, to change the subject, do you eat at your university? And what's that like? Sorry if I missed a bit about it. No, I... I've eaten at the cafeteria here, the canteen, and the food is good. It's Cantonese food. It's not spicy. It's kind of bland, um, but it's very cheap. It's plentiful, and it's delicious. It's perfectly fine. I don't eat there every day, maybe once a week. Uh, so I cannot deny it. I, I like cooking. I have a kitchen in my apartment, so I like cooking on my own. Would you advise American people to learn Chinese and their culture question? so that they would not discriminate China? Absolutely, 100%. I've done videos about this and I, the more, longer I'm here, the more I believe that. I advise Americans to learn Chinese and to understand Chinese culture and Chinese people. Uh, it's a country that has been so closed off for so long and that has allowed stereotypes and misunderstandings to fester. So the more that we learn about each other, and I think things like the trade war and all of that would be less and less of an issue. Uh, what's that? There was a, a, a debate on Fox Business, American um, lady business host was deba uh, debating the Chinese CGTV host and, about the trade war. And it was a very, there was a very interesting dissection of it that really outlined the the true differences between the two cultures and why they don't see eye to eye and it's not just a language barrier it's a culture barrier and the more we learn about each other the the better it is we have a symbiotic relationship the two countries we shouldn't be fighting about this stuff we should be working together so that everyone benefits you know if we um <laughs> if huawei wants to do business in america they can pay for it if Apple needs to do business in America. They need to pay for it. It's the way the world goes around. and Everyone benefits. Paul, I want to ask you, what kind of thing in China make you think that it is weird or not the same as you think? I'm curious what you mean by that. What kind of thing in China make you think that is weird or not the same as you think? Are you asking me what do I think is weird in China? Um... I don't think anything is necessarily weird. I've 
been around the world enough to see weird things. It's just things are different. Um, and you learn and you get used to it. Um, I'll give you an example. So like the toilets, you know, I'm from America. We have sit toilets. So when I first saw the squat toilet, I didn't know how to use it. <laughs> so I had to learn how to use it. It's not weird. It's just different. You know, and I didn't have the leg strength to squat and use it, you know, so I had to build that up. Same thing happened when I went to a Japanese hotel in Los Angeles, it was a Japanese hotel, and they had one of those Japanese toilets with all the buttons and it was all electronic. And I was like, holy shit, I didn't know how to use it. It's not weird, it's just different. And that's all I can really say. The different habits between Chinese and US. Be more specific because everyone has habits. You have good habits and bad habits. Um, I mean, you can say that, oh, everyone smokes in China. Well, there are a lot of smokers in America, too. Uh, people chew with their mouth open. They do that here in China. Well, a lot of people do that in America, too. So it's it's tough to, to what do you call it, to stereotype an entire culture. Um, I, I can't do that. If you point to one thing in particular, I could talk about it. But there's so many differences. I mean, you can talk about the difference between Hong Kong and China. Now, Hong Kong drive on the left side of the road, and China drives on the right side of the road. And you have to do this when you cross the border. I mean, to someone from Hong Kong, that's weird. I don't, I don't know if it's weird. It's just different. Uh, felicity habit. I have to be more specific. I don't understand by felicity habit, man. <laughs> okay. So that's interesting. I'm going to do one more and then I'm going to call it a night. I started the stream late, so uh, I'm going to stay on a little bit late. Sorry about that, guys. I had uh, technical difficulties. No, I'm not there. Uh, there we go. Changes in the Gao Cow. For teachers and parents, this came out recently from China Daily, just a couple days ago. China's 2019 National College Entrance Exam will start on June 7th. Here are some information for parents and students on what is considered by many to be the most exam of all. The Gao Cao is a big reason why the English industry exists in China. I mean, because English is such a huge part of the Gao Cao, and the Gao Cao is such a huge part of <laughs> of college entrance. I think it's like. It's, it's the some of the top tier have other little tests that you have to take, but what, what you get on the Gao Cao really determines your future. So it's so important. You know, in America, we have the SAT and the ACT, but you know, there's so many other factors that go into what college you go to and how successful you're going to be. Here, the Gao Cao is just a huge part of it. Over 10 million students to sit for the Gao Cao. More than 10 million students have applied to take part in the annual examination this year. Minister of Education Chen Baosheng said earlier this month at a meeting to ensure the smoothness of the examination known as the Gao Cao. He urged efforts to guarantee the safety of the test papers, the sound organization of exam sites, quality and grading and grading and fairness in college enrollment. Data showed in 2018 there were 9.75 million applicants, increasing 350,000 from 2017. So as many colleges as there are in China, there's a ton of students trying to get into those colleges. I mean, it, it's very competitive. It's, it's su very surprising. And every year, I think the Chinese government just e increased their education budget by like 8% uh, in the last year. So they're, they're getting better and they're opening up more colleges and colleges are expanding, but there's still a hell of a lot more students that want to go to college than there actually are. Um, I have a question. Soon I will have a class where I will teach English to adults to improve their pronunciation. So how can I teach them? Because I have no idea. Are you friends with your Chinese university staff? I am. Yeah. My colleague, I have my neighbors, a couple of uh, teachers are my neighbors and, you know, friendly neighborly chats, I guess. Um, most of my Chinese colleagues don't speak English, and my Chinese is still not to the point where I can have true, you know, meaningful conversations. You know, it's just very friendly chats that I can have. But my in the English department, I get along with all of them. Um, I I know I can call most of them and count on them if I need any assistance. And 
we've hung out on a social level a few times and they're all married. <laughs> I think only one of them is, is not married, but she actually got engaged recently. So she'll be married soon. And they have children. So I'm a single guy that lives on the college and they have their own families. So I don't hang out with them, you should say, but I'm very friendly with them and they're all wonderful people. Uh, you will teach a pronunciation class. Uh, that is something you should uh, know if you're a teacher. Um, when I teach pronunciation classes, I usually pick one or two certain pronunciation issues that I'm going to focus on. If I don't know the the status of the, it also depends on the class class size. But if I I have to assess their pronunciation issues, most students have a very individualized pronunciation issue. Uh, if you have you know ten people in a class and each one's going to have their own issue, but there are generally some pronunciation issues that all Chinese students have, mostly because the sounds don't exist in Chinese, such as the sound, you know, like if they say, you know, thank you, right? The TH sound, right? Uh, you have the, the unvoiced the th and the voiced, th, right? But they don't have a sound, but their tongue comes out of their mouth like that. So that's why you hear in their accent, they'll say, thank you. And you have to teach them to stick that tongue out and get that authentic sound. So that is one thing that I can basically point to in almost every class. There's always a majority of students that are still struggling with that. And you get them to work on that. And the other pronunciation thing is more about syllable stress. They'll put the wrong the wrong stress on the syllable. And of course, for heteronyms, that changes the definition of the, of the word itself. So that's very important. In Chinese pinyin, you have the tones, the uh, shu, 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 right? English doesn't have that. So knowing where to put the syllable stresses on words can be a very difficult part of their pronunciation training. So another one is things like um, the word orange or knowledge or college, right? With a G-E at the end. In Chinese pinyin, that G-E would be a G, right? Yeah, uh, bu, ke. So a lot of them put an extra syllable, uh, an extra syllable on those words. So they'll say orangey or knowledgey when it should just be knowledge, orange. You know, so getting the, that hard consonant at the end without adding a vowel sound to it is another pronunciation issue. It's very, very common in, in China. So you can always point to those things, R's and L's, five. You know, so you get that the, the voiced and unvoiced. These types of uh, pronunciation issues are pretty standard, pretty common. Um, again, though, if you have a class of 10 students, you'll have a couple of them that get that and do it really well. Others will have another problem over here. Uh, there's also little bad habits that uh, that you can focus on. If you have a very large class, very hard to teach pronunciation in a large class. It really needs to be you know, individualized. Uh, are you friends with, oh, uh, the English pronunciation is the primary school lessons of Chinese English learning uh, being teach at the age of six to 10. That's true, but it's still very, very difficult for a lot of Chinese students. Again, some do better than others. It's very individualized. Uh, we always pronounce thank you, thank you. Yeah, so it's either gonna be the thank you or you're gonna hear that Thank you. They to make the th sound, you have to stick your tongue out between your teeth to get that authentic. Thank you. Um, and of course, it also depends on: Are you teaching British English or American English? Because there's different pronunciations there. <laughs> so, in general, though, uh, I wish you luck. I wish you luck, man. <laughs> I, I need more information from you. You know what you guys talking about. All right, number two, a more comprehensive 2019 Gaokao. The exam should test all around qualities such as morality and reduce testing of knowledge by rote, aiming to facilitate students' key abilities and core qualities in teaching and examination, the Ministry of Education said in April. Universities are expected to add a physical exam for independent enrollment in the hope students would attach more importance to physical training. Great. That's a new one. Uh, interesting. So in order to go to college, you have to be physically fit. That's wonderful. <laughs> it sounds like boot camp. Any behavioral, any behavior violating regulations or laws in the exam will receive severe punishment. 
Yeah. Number three, measures to prevent Gaokao immigration. The Ministry of Education issued an urgent notice to schools to prevent Gaokao immigration. Hmm. Gaokao immigrations refers to those individuals who lack a huko, that's the household registration, uh, or student uh, status in the province, but still attend the Gaokao in that province. High schools should strictly follow admission procedures and policies and are banned from vying for A students in violation of regulations. So if you don't know what the HUCO is, the HUCO is, it's their household registration. It's it's kind of similar to, uh, I, I, I'll say it's similar to like a state uh, residency in America. You know, if you're a California resident, South Dakota resident, that's where you vote, that's where your driver's license is, uh, that's where you pay your taxes, things like this, okay? Uh, the HUCO system is kind of outdated and it needs to be revamped or completely gone away with, but it's there for a reason and um, it's it's not difficult to change your HUCO from, in most cases. So you just, you, that's why if your HUCO is in one province, then you have to take the Gaokao in that province. Hey, Jacob, yo, what's up, man? Watching you live from down the street. Yeah, hey, dude, good to see you in, in Gaokao, man. Um, that's very good. Jacob, how's uh, how's life going? Um, I do these. Jacob doesn't know, but I do these live streams about maybe once a month or so, and just a answer questions and read some articles. The British English is difficult, just like a new language to me. <laughs> yeah, the English is called the Queen's English. I think British English is, to be honest, I think British English is sounds better than American English. That's my opinion. And there's a friendly competition between Brits and Americans on who has the best English. <laughs> End of the month, so you know, lots of paperwork to get done. Yeah, you got to close out all your classes. I already did that, dude. Um, oh, that's right. Tomorrow's June 1st. Well, it's June 1st now. <laughs> all right, going back to this. Uh, college admission policy changes. Starting this year, there will be only five batches of universities for students to apply from Ningxia. I shoot, I'm sorry if I mispronounced. Autonomous region after combining second and third batches of university. Beijing has also combined its first and second batches of universities for students to apply, but allows students to apply to up to 16 universities and six majors at each. Wow, that's impressive. So that's a huge increase. Sichuan province has increased school number from six to nine for students to apply in each batch. That's great. So there's more options for students to have. You know, you apply, you get in. Uh, the The biggest problem when you pick when you pick your your major, you can't change it. <laughs> uh, unlike in America, you can change your your major as many that turns mine a bunch of times. Uh, Ziggy, may I ask you a question on YouTuber Zerpin ZA? Of course, there are many controversial judgments towards him on the net now, and I would just like to hear some of from a foreigner's perspective. Be more specific, what uh, what controversial judgments are you speaking about with with him? Here's, here's my thing with him. Uh, a few years ago, I wasn't even coming to China. I was gonna go to Korea. And mostly because China, for me, was a little intimidating. I mean, didn't know anything about it. And, uh, you know, coming from America, there's a lot of misinformation about what China's really about. Most Americans don't really understand. They have a very false, impression of china they don't know what it truly is like so and i was one of them you know i remember my first day in china when i got here i was scared to go for a walk at night you know i was in the hotel and I packed up my backpack with some water and my passport and i thought for surely a policeman would see me and throw me in jail because i'm a foreigner walking on the street and i'm i consider myself a very enlightened worldly guy and i've traveled the world but that was how i felt china was like and that was only three and a half, four years ago. Obviously, that's not the case. And I know that now, and I tell everybody this. But many foreigners believe that about China, mostly because there's not enough information about China. It's very closed off. So when I started watching YouTube and I saw Zerpin Sede uh, videos, he was talking about things that were everyday occurrences. He was talking about how to use an ATM, how to go to the dentist, you know. Uh, this food, eat this food, this street food is really good, that street food is very good. And it was very valuable information for a newbie to come and 
and do this. And it kind of lessened my anxiety and gave me some tools to survive here. And over the years, he's gotten a lot more political. He's gotten a lot more opinionated. And as a Westerner, I think that's fine. I have no problems with you being political or opinionated about anything. That's your opinion. And I agree with some of it and I disagree with others, but I admire his tenacity. He's played the game well. He's played the YouTube game well. He's back in America now and he's growing and expanding beyond China. So he's, he's done well for himself. So I admire him for that. Again, just because you disagree with one thing he says or a couple things he says, doesn't make him a bad guy. I've never met him, but for the most part, he seems like a decent dude. Um, but if you want more specific topics, I can't just give an overall impression. The first day in China was crazy only because I had to use the washroom in the airport and was my first brought the holy shit, someone stole those people's toilets. <laughs> I just talked about that, Jacob, about you know the, the squat toilet. The the crazy thing, I know how to use it, but I remember when I when I squatted down to use it, I wasn't a catcher playing baseball, so I didn't have the leg strength to to maintain that position comfortably you know i was like holding up bracing myself on the walls right uh and of course there was no toilet paper in there either so you, know, you had to I had to fish through my bag and look for some paper <laughs> so you, know, you you get used to it after a while the same thing happened on the japanese toilet you know i press a button and water shoots up and you go oh my god what's that <laughs> It's fine. Someone should, I should do a video about using squat toilets in China. <laughs> the how to video. Okay. Favorable policies for rural students. I'm going to finish this article and I'm going to get off because it's getting late, guys. Uh, I feel you, man. I have a an ACL, torn ACL. Chinese can't do it without falling over. <laughs> Here's the crazy thing, though. Now that I'm used to Chinese toilets, I won't go back and use American toilets. I won't use a sit down toilet. I won't sit on them. I'm so used to squat toilets. So they're so much better and more hygienic. They smell, they don't smell as nice, but it's much, much better. And I think it's healthier too. You, I used to be a yoga instructor and you can see it, it's much, much healthier for your body. Okay, Jacob, have a good night, dude. Talk to you soon, man. All right, so favorable policies for rural students. Students from China's rural and poor areas will continue to enjoy favorable policies when they apply for major universities in 2019. The poverty-stricken counties entitled to special enrollment plans will continue to enjoy such policies in the 2019, uh, even if they have already shaken off poverty. China's medical colleges will enroll 6,700 rural students this year who will work for rural health centers in central and western China upon graduation. That's that's an interesting point. With fast uh, with Financing from the central government students will enjoy five-year free education in majors including clinical medicine, traditional Chinese medicine, traditional Mongolian medicine, traditional Tibetan medicine, and traditional Dai ethnic medicine. I think the Dai people are from Yunnan. Now, interesting. I, I think that that is very, very cool. There's all this talk about China and people going off, uh, coming from rural areas to the cities. And that's happening, but I also think you'll see people moving back to the countryside, you know, looking for a less hectic lifestyle. And the, the countryside, some of these poor villages, give it a generation, but some of these villages are just going to be the beautiful, most beautiful places in China to, to live and raise a family. And it's because of things like this that make it happen. So it's good on them. No excessive publicity of Gao Kao Zhuangyuan. Gao Kao's top scorers, known as the Zhuangyuan, have long been worshipped in China, but this year the Ministry of Education has strictly cautioned authorities not to publicize them. They didn't know that. The rate of students enrolled by universities is also banned in promotion by schools, and slogans for Gao Kao are also under strict management. Hmm, that's interesting. I didn't know that. Very, very interesting. Hey, right, Billy. Have a good night, dude. Good talking to you, too, man. Uh, reform plans for Gaokao in more provinces. Eight provincial-level regions joined the Gaokao reform this year. The change will cover students who entered high schools in fall 2018 or later in Hubei, Liaoning, uh, Jiangsu, Fujian, Hubei, Hunan, Guangdong, and Chongqing. The reform allows the students to have more choices, up to 12 combinations of subjects 
instead of the current two choices between arts and science. Their performances during high school academic tests will also serve as measurable, and this is great. This is all good stuff, I think. A total of 14 regions are implementing the comprehensive reform since the state council in 2014 initiated it. The other six regions are Shanghai, Zhejiang, Beijing, Tianjin, Shandong, and Hainan. So great news for the cow cow. And standardized testing, you know, the, the Chinese are really good at that stuff. Okay, so do you guys have any final questions for me? Because I'm going to get off and call it a night. It's really late and my jaws hurt and I'm going to take some medicine for it. Uh, if not, uh, interesting evening. Uh, my VPN goes off and on. I'm sorry if I was late. But uh, tomorrow I'm going to be posting my next video, which is about um, – how to get money out of China. It's in the can, it's edited, it's uploaded, and it will be published tomorrow at 10.30 p.m. China time, which is 7.30 a.m. Uh, American time or California time. So be on the lookout for that. I put a lot of work into this, a lot of research, how to get money out of China. Uh, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully it helps me. So hopefully it'll help you too. So if that's all, thank you all very much. Good talk with all of you, and we'll see you soon. Take care.